our CI system, we should take around 60 to 90 minutes uh, to produce a stable build artifact after pulling the code, uh, compiling the code, and running all the available tests. Now, that's a very long time. And it used to get uh, pretty worse when the test failed or the builds failed. Because you know, when the previous build was running, multiple developers would commit their code. Now to go and identify which commit actually caused the problem and then to fix that problem, it would take further hours, a couple of four or five hours to actually produce the next set of artifacts. You can only imagine you know, what happens when you know, someone uh, doesn't do the isolation correctly, if they are not able to find the problem correctly. Or if there's a mistake in fixing the problem, the time was much longer. Uh, evidently, like you know, our QA teams and our uh, development teams were not pretty happy about it. Our ability to get quick feedback, to learn out of that feedback, and then to take a, a course correction action on it, you know, it was completely hampered, and there was, there was frustration all around. The long-running build cycles also had, uh, you know, impact on how the developers behave. Like, uh, they were very afraid of committing their code frequently. Or like, if they commit their code and the builds fail, uh, even if it's not their problem, but they have to go and look into it, wasting their time. Or they were also afraid to commit their code during evening times. I can you imagine that, like, if I, if I commit my code during evening times and the build, build fails, boy, well, my entire evening is lost. So the, the tendency then would be to actually, like, you know, hold on to the code for longer time. And when you hold on to the code longer time, what, we, what happens is, uh, now you have to be away from you know what's there on your repository. You have to spend more time to merge that code. Uh, now again think about it. Like if, if the disk crashes in between, again our entire efforts are lost. Now these are just business impacts, but uh, a long running cycle, a build cycle, also has social impacts. Like me, has anyone been in a situation where you had to you know stay back late night uh, to integrate your code uh, with, with your coworkers? Just because you do not have CI in the first place, or it's a you know long running CI, okay? Or have you been in a situation where like you know you have to rush home, leaving behind an unstable build uh, just so that you don't miss a dinner or dinner with your family or friends? Huh? Well, this is how your colleagues will be looking at you, and pointing at you when that happens. Or have you decided like you know to stay back late night, make sure that uh, your commits are good, uh, the build is all green, all the tests are passing, and the build artifacts are available. Uh, so that like you know your colleagues are not pointing fingers at you, but now worse, like you know you have to hear your daughter crying and say, "Dad, you're late today again." Are these situations familiar to you? Yes. Are these acceptable to you? No. So these situations were not acceptable to acceptable to me as well, and that's what led me on a quest to reduce our CI build time. This is how our new CI looks like. I'll quickly go through how it uh, how it is. Uh, this is our code build, so it is triggered whenever a developer commits the code. The only job it performs is pull the code from the repository. Then uh, a build is triggered, which does the job of compilation and producing our build artifacts and database artifacts. Then it triggers two builds in parallel. One is a deploy build and one is a testing build. Uh, the deploy build picks up the artifacts. The artifacts are deployed in the integration environment. And on that integration environment, we run our BDT tests and our REST tests. That's on the deployed application. Whereas our testing job, it actually invokes a couple of other test jobs which are running in parallel, uh, which, which run in a standalone environment. So this is our new job looks like. Now once all the tests are finished, uh, the main build would then uh, you know, pick up the artifacts and it would publish the artifacts on the artifact tree, so that it's available for you know, any, any developer or QA. <coughs> now if you, if you look at this cycle, it's it's come down to under 10, I mean, you, can, you can't see it here, but it's, it's definitely at a 10 minutes now. So what it means is, like earlier we were having, you know, we had to wait 60 to 90 minutes to get the build artifacts. And at the same time, we can actually produce six to uh, nine builds. Uh, you know, that increases our ability to get quicker feedback. It increases our ability to quickly learn from it, quickly course correct, and again, you know, move ahead. So now the developers are not afraid to commit the code frequently. They are not afraid to commit their code during evening times. Uh, let's look at some key principles now. From my point of view, uh, there are three key principles that you have to work on uh, to, you know, to achieve uh, that objective. The very first principle is focusing on motivation. Like as a developer or a QA, I need to understand uh, which part of my system is slow. I also need to understand how I do, how would I go and you know find out uh, which part is slow. The second principle is divide and conquer. Uh, we talked about cores earlier. There are a lot of CPUs and we have, we have a lot of cores. Now we want to make sure that we break down our problem in such a way that we can consume all the cores available. That way we can speed up our uh, builds. And the last one is fail fast. 
So if, if, if there is a slightest possibility, possibility of failure, then you would want to fail as fast as possible so that you can recover from it and you can re-attempt. And you know you, have, you get more opportunities to uh, to to course correct your action. So these are the three uh, three three key principles that I see. So let's look at uh, focusing on bottlenecks. Uh, based on your experience, what do you think leads uh, to bottlenecks in the systems that you're working on? Anything? Any idea? Any experience? Sorry? Yeah, but what's the cause of it? What what leads to those long running tests? Indication that normally it takes too much time because they connect to the external system and say, I am. I am. I see. Okay. I think you just finish up here. I mean, if you're dealing with native code like C and if like there are huge number of you know objects to be compiled, I mean, typically that's the business case I work on. It just compiling itself takes a long, and again it depends on OS. It depends, suppose, say for HP on some some OSs, uh, OS specific sometimes it, it takes around seven hours to build. I mean, it, maybe it's because of our volume of a code, okay. but that's how. Sure. So in my experience, what I've seen is uh, any type of I/O, especially disk I/O, uh, causes a lot of bottlenecks in, in the environment that we're working. So let's look at some examples, like you know, simplest things like file operations. Anything to do with file, copying files, deleting files, updating files, searching for files, it's going to slow down the test. The other example is uh, like you know, database operations. If our tests are very much dependent on, on data, if we are you know, creating data at runtime, modifying the data, updating the data, deleting the data, that's going to again slow down our uh, slow down the, uh, the test. Now what's the alternative, right? The simplest alternative is to uh, avoid this guy. So while I was on my quest, like, that was the first thing that I started looking for. You know, what are the obvious things in our system that are taking longer time? So I started going through the Jenkins configuration, started going through uh, the log files that, that we have. And what I discovered was, uh, like, you know, this is our previous build infrastructure was like the core job, or by multiple children job. And the core job would do the builds, and then these are the test jobs. Now all those test jobs require the artifacts and the code that the parent job actually pulled. Now when you create a new job in Jenkins, it gives a new workspace uh, to that particular job. So in our earlier days when we were not too much aware about you know, how things work, uh, we did a very simple thing. At that point of time, we decided that whenever the child job would run, it would simply clean up its workspace and it would copy the parent's workspace and then run the test. Now our workspace is about 3 GBs. So over a period of time, when you have 5 jobs running in parallel, all those jobs, were cleaning up their workspaces of 3 GBs and copying 3, 3 GBs every day. Now, just looking at the configuration, you know, we, we found uh, this and it was everything that you know, we have to get rid of. Now, we found two options. Like one option was NKLink. Uh, that's a utility provided by Windows. What Windows does is, using NKLink, you can create a shortcut between two folders. And with that shortcut, there was no need of copying anything. So my child workspace could point to the parent workspace. And you now the code was ready available right there. Then we also discovered that Jenkins itself provides an option. Like when you create a custom job, you can have an option, uh, an advanced option, which says, you know, what is the workspace that you want to use. So to the child job, you can say that use a parent workspace. So that eliminated the need of, like, you know, uh, dealing with files completely. The next thing that we did was, again, uh, kept looking at uh, the scripts that we had. And what I found was that we created for having too many visitors in our system. And during the build, we were reading the visitors and converting it to the Java files. Now our visitors were not really getting modified every day. But with every build, we were taking the head of you know creating the source code from the visitor and compiling the source code and then generating the Java file. So this again was easy. Uh, we had to just you know shift to reusing the jars which are already created. There are there are still situations where like you know we couldn't actually get rid of our uh, disk I/O. As an example, there was a test job. Uh, which was running on a pre-populated database, and that was a huge database. Now, with every uh, every run, it would clean up the database and then unzip the prior database and then run tests run test on top of it. Now, while working with our tech ops guys, uh, they actually suggested, like, you know, why don't we use Google Copy? Now, Google Copy has a very nice feature. What it does is, uh, you can do a mirroring between our two directories. Google Copy is equivalent to asking from the people who are on the user's library. So uh, by doing that mirror, it actually can detect which files have changed, and it will only you know copy those files. The rest files it won't touch. So that again reduces the time required uh, to go and do any of the file operations. 
Yes. Yes. That was for DB. It was only, it, it, could, it could be for anything. So like you know, in the two directories you can have let's say two workspaces, two <coughs> databases, it could be anything. All it is doing is comparing the two locations and then finding out what has modified and then it will go and copy only the modifications. So in earlier case it was a blind copy, right? Like it will delete everything, copy everything irrespective of whether it has changed or not. So this is just a different change, different change. change. But then what does Ubuntu copy has extra different than RC? Or Ubuntu copy is Windows. R sync is Unix. Okay. Now uh, we at Ideas are into analytics, and what we do is we do a lot of forecasting. We have a lot of algorithms that we run, and uh, in by scanning some log files for one of the tests, what we discovered was the test was running uh, generating forecasts for the next 10 years. Now in the context of that test, uh, generating forecasts for the next 10 years was not required. It was the only, the only thing that we were doing was we were trying we were doing the in integration test. So our job was to see if you know, we are able to make a call to SAS, if the SAS is able to generate the forecast, and then it's not returning back or not. Now, simply looking at the log highlighted that fact, which was not earlier visible. So we modified it to 15 days. So our forecast window from 10 years brought it down to you know, 15 days. And again, that helped uh, solve that problem. So the larger the data sets that you have, it's going to always take more time to you know, read the data, to try write the data. So you want to have your data sets as small as possible. Right? in the context of what, what you are doing. The next alternative to hard drives are like you know, SSDs. Hard drives are mechanical drives. They have uh, spinning wheels, spinning disks. Uh, that causes a lot of delays in seeking information from the disk. Whereas a solid state drive, it has, uh, it doesn't have any mechanical part. It has, it has flash memory. It's, it's very you know, fast to get any information from it. Now down below, I have some comparisons here. The comparison between a standard SATA drive and uh, an SSD. And it shows the number of I.O. operations that can be performed uh, per second on those on the two drives. And you can see that these numbers are very high, indicating it's much more faster. Now, instead of looking at those numbers, this is how I visualize a hard drive and an SSD. And hard drive are visualized like, you know, single lane highway where things are converging and leading to a bottle line. Whereas I imagine an SSD as a five lane highway where my traffic can zoom through. Now, our Jenkins environment uh, is hosted on a virtual machine. And that virtual machine is hosted on a virtual server. Now going and getting the hard drive or SSD for our virtual server was very expensive. It, it, it meant that you know I have to go and make budget modifications, I have to take approvals, and I didn't want to get into that activity at all. So instead of that, I started thinking, you know, what is it that I can do by which uh, you know I can get faster feedback from my database? I know that my databases are slow. So then we thought of like, you know, okay, let's try in, in memory databases. In our product, we are using MySQL. Uh, so the natural choice for us was to look at the MySQL's uh, heap engine. Now the heap engine, as, it, as the name says, the memory heap engine is then memory. It's not on the database. Now memory is much faster than either the hard drive or the SSD is which much more faster. Uh, but as we started working on it or reading about it, what we found that there are a couple of limitations in, in the MySQL heap uh, engine. It doesn't support a couple of data types that we were using. And there was no point changing our code or our schema just to suit the MySQL, uh, MySQL's memory engine. So we moved ahead, we found HyperSQL. HyperSQL is again another popular uh, in memory database. While working on HyperSQL, HyperSQL provides a MySQL dialect, uh, which helps uh, you know, executing MySQL queries on HyperSQL. But again, the problem there is that it doesn't support all the native queries that are, uh, uh, that are supported by MySQL. Our product is a 10 year old product, right? And we have been using MySQL from 10 years. And because we are in an ASP mode, or the deployment is under our, our control, uh, our database or anything is not driven by the client. So we, we have a choice of what, what we need to use. So over a period of time, we have landed up using a lot of custom, native MySQL queries, which are very much performant in the context of what, what we do. So uh, you know, HyperSQL was not an option. So the search continued. And that's where you know, we found H2 database. Now, H2 database supports uh, many more MySQL queries uh, than what HyperSQL does. So that was a natural choice. But again, while working on it, I discovered that like, you know, uh, heavily used queries like insert on duplicate update uh, in MySQL, it's, it doesn't support. So that was that was my choice. Then we came up with, we came across MemSQL. Now, MemSQL is supposed to be the fastest in-memory database available. And uh, like, you know, the, the best part of MemSQL is that it is wire compatible with MySQL. What it means is that I don't have to now code make any code changes. I can simply point my code and my schema to uh, MemSQL, 
and do all the tests and everything is going to run without, without any problems. So that was that was the most uh, you know optimistic feature of MySQL. But the problem that we again discovered was that this MySQL can be installed only on Linux books. And our entire Jenkins environment is a Windows based environment. Now just to have uh, in memory database, we didn't want to introduce another like operating system in our in our environment. And most likely, I was looking for an option where uh, I would I would be able to use in memory and in process version of the uh, memory uh, in memory database, so not like you know a network option of in memory database. <coughs> so like you know, I, I went through so many options, and uh, I was I, I thought always I thought like you know my I, it would solve my problem, but it didn't solve the problem. And I was kind of thinking like you know the only problem that I have is I have MySQL, I have a lot of native queries which are MySQL specific. What if I'm able to put my existing MySQL database on on the in the memory by some something? And if I'm able to do that, then I don't have to worry about anything. And uh, that you know that aspect actually helped me discover something called as RAM drives. And SoftPerfect is one of the examples of the software. What it does is it actually helps you create a drive out of your memory. So let's say your machine has three GBs of uh, 32 GBs of RAM. Sort of 32 GBs of RAM, you can say that okay, carve out a 4 GB of RAM drive using software. So for all practical purposes, all the applications that are running on that machine, that drive would look like any other drive. The only difference is the drive is not on the disk or SSD, but it's in memory, right? And this is how, these are the numbers for uh, the RAM drive. So if you compare to what we saw earlier, these are way higher, right? I, I would imagine a RAM drive like a 10 lane, 10 lane super high, where all my traffic can zoom through. So I was pretty happy with this find because now, like you know, all I have to do was pick up my MySQL database, put it on that drive, change my my.ina settings, and run my test. And with that excitement, I actually did all that, and again I was disappointed. I was disappointed because it just did not work. And I was like, you know, I was very upset after, after that, because it had to work. My theory was all right. My theory was that, uh, SQL queries are slow, database IO is slow, or it's always slow. We were heavily using uh, SQL, you know, database operations in our test. So it had to work, but somehow it didn't work. And then I probably created a second hypothesis. My hypothesis was that maybe, like you know, my assumption that I have lots of database IO traffic, maybe that hypothesis is incorrect. Maybe I have a sparse traffic. And if I have sparse traffic, no matter how many lane highway I create, it's not going to help me in any way. So the next job was to figure out, okay, where do I find my bottlenecks? How do I, you know, figure out what is really causing the problems in the system? And that's what, you know, led me on doing some profiling. Profiling of our test cases, all the German tests that we had. Now, uh, I'm using the JVM monitor uh, plugin provided by Eclipse. And like, a, like any other like, uh, profiling plugin, it gives you hotspots. And the hotspots will tell you which are the methods that are taking over there. It will tell you the number of times a particular method was called and the time that it took itself to, you know, uh, how much CPU time it took to carry out some activity. So, doing this CPU profiling helped us identify a lot of hidden information in our own code base that was not evident so far. The very first uh, issue that we found that we were using uh, resource bundles and those resource bundles were in our jar files. Now, every time a resource bundle was requested, the code was going and scanning all the jar files that are available. And scanning jar files is again a very IO intensive operation. Now, the, the, the solution was simple though. Like, you know, all we had to do was uh, cache it immediately. So once the resource is found, I cache it and don't go and search the jar files again. The next discovery was like I think Arun today morning already mentioned uh, how many of you are using Spring here? Spring, okay. So if you are working with Spring, you would know that. Uh, the application context uh, in Spring, it takes a lot of time to load. And in our case, it was taking about 5 to 10 seconds. Now, 5 to 10 seconds sounds uh, pretty low uh, when an application is starting. But in the context of test, that's a pretty high time. Because what happens is every test that we have, a lot of tests that we had, was loading the Spring context every day. So those 10, 10, 10, 10 seconds started piling up. And what we also discovered was that there were a couple of uh, test cases where in the before method, the, the context was loaded. What that means is like if in my test case, in my test class, if there are let's say 10 test scenarios, in the before method if I'm doing the spring context, then for every test scenario that I have, it is going to load the spring context. Now, like you know, this was again not evident if, if we had not done the CPU profiling. 
So we have to refactor all our classes, uh, test classes, and after doing the refactoring, we again cached the stream context. The stream context was getting shared by all the test cases, and you know that saved many reports. Excuse me. Yep. So you, you are asking the difference between the two. Oh, they are completely different. The profiling would help me identify which areas in my code are taking longer time. That's the idea of profiling, profiling anything, like memory profiling or CPU profiling, that's the idea. Scheduling is where you would go and you know, schedule a task at a particular time. Particular. So no, no comparison. Okay. The next thing uh, that we discovered was that uh, through our tests, we were sending out a lot of emails out. And again, in the context of test, sending out emails was not required. And uh, again, doing the profile, we discovered that because we were sending so much of emails out, it was again taking chunk of in, you know, chunk of time of our test. So then the next goal was, like, you know, instead of uh, uh, we introduced actually a, a test parameter, which, which would tell whether that whether this is a production environment or whether it's a development or a test environment. So if it was a test environment, we avoided sending out emails. So CPU profiling had a little bit. The, our biggest insight by doing CPU profiling was the Java calendar is horribly slow. That's what we discovered. And now again, I said, like, you know, we are an analytical company. We do, do a lot of data crunching. We also do a lot of data arithmetic. And we discovered that, like, let's say, in one of our process, I'm not sure if the colors are visible right there. So let's say that process was taking 20 minutes to run, out of which 87% of the time was taken just doing date arithmetic using calendar, like you know finding the date, comparing the date, adding the date. That's all. That that, that much time it took. Uh, with that finding, we you know switched to Yoda date time. So after we switched to Yoda date time, we also you know started using some deprecated Java APIs. Although it's recommended not to use that. Uh, we have done that, we have just to make sure that you know, even though we upgrade our Java versions, that would do work fine. But in the context of what we do, you know, it, it the combination of Yoda, in the combination of you know, Yoda and deprecated date library saved us 93% 90, of you know, that time. And the date calculation scheme was so so was so good. Now, mind you, this is not just a test cases, right? Now, what we did here suddenly started impacting our production too, because this, we had this problem in production and we were not even aware about it. Our test simply highlighted that problem. We took care of it. How many of you are using Ant here? And okay, cool. So this was another discovery that we had. Like Ant has uh, two parameters, like port and port mode. Uh, the port mode is an optional parameter and port mode, port parameter, when it is yes, what it tells Ant is create a new JVM to run all the tests. Right? And when this parameter fourth mode is not available, it indicates JVM that by default, uh, sorry, it indicates I am that by default create a new JVM for every test class that you are executing. So if you have thousands of test cases, it is going to create thousands of VMs, right? So we switched, sorry, we switched the fourth mode and we used the option as once. So the once option, what told and was, okay, do create a JVM, but run all the tests in the same JVM. Because, like we talked about caching earlier, right? So one thing is, creation of so many JVMs was expensive. Second is, all the caching that we did earlier, it was of no use if we were if we were creating a VM per test. So this option right? For people who are using uh, Maven here, Maven also has a sure path plugin, yeah. And so sure path plugin also has the same configuration, but thankfully, in by default, I think it enforced only one uh, VM. <coughs> so, you know, this helped us a lot in reducing the time. So that, you know, covers the section of focusing on bottlenecks, right? The next is uh, so, divide and conquer. Yeah. So there was no DB uh, switching you did, right? In memory DB was, uh, was eliminated. That was secure. So we, yeah, I mean, we, we, we had that in memory data, yeah. list, but it did not work at that point of time. You didn't uh, choose that option, right? We continued with it. Like, let's say, for example, uh, when that was introduced, at that point of time, it was not usable much. But as we, you know, discovered the rest of the problems in our system, and as we reduced the other I/O bottlenecks that we had, now the amount, now the database operations they started becoming significant. Yeah. So you didn't switch. That's what I wanted. You didn't switch. You know, I didn't move away from. Yeah. yeah I didn't move away from. Yeah. Yes. And you said uh, using a RAM drive anyway did not work for you. That's okay, fine. But thing is, 
if, if you use RAM drive and say out of your 2 GB RAM you keep 1 GB for your RAM drive, uh, will, will your actual memory suffer? So you will have actual yes. memory, so it is as a trade off. No, it depends, right? Let's say for example, with our case, our VMs have 32 GBs of RAM. So basically, those RAM drives are useful when you have lots of RAM to play with. And the, and your disks are becoming a constraint. That's why the RAM drives come handy. Otherwise, they're not handy. Sure. So uh, they did. The RAM drives did not help us in the first shot. But as the rest of the uh, bottlenecks went down, the RAM drives started helping us. Right? So, as a final, are you using RAM drive or not? We are using it. Okay, the next step, yes. Uh, uh, you said like for email services, you are uh, avoiding those in the test cases. Right? Yes. But in case those uh, email services working or working fine or not, how do you get them? Correct. So, like in the context of all the tests that we had, the email service was not useful. Right? Uh, in one of our product, uh, the product I'm working on right now, there we have not used it. But my understanding is there are in memory email servers actually, which you can use and do those testing. But we haven't done that because we, we are not testing the email server. Okay, but uh, in my project, what we are doing, we are uh, uh, for sending the emails, we are uh, using the threads. Uh, so okay. using thread, we can send the emails. It will not uh, it will not hit your performance in the test cases. I mean, like, it doesn't matter right? whether you, it's a it's a thread or not. Some CPU time is going to get you. Think about it in the following way: instead of running the uh, instead of spending time doing the sending the emails, I could use the same time to do something else, which is more productive for me. Right, so I could I could avoid emails. I could do I in the same thread I could do something else. And that's how I would look at it. Because in, in that context it was not important, right? It, it's very context specific. <coughs> okay, so next is uh, divide and conquer. And uh, what we did, let's look at our you know this, uh, our grid Python again. So we talked about earlier that we these two jobs are running in parallel, all these jobs are running in parallel. So again, the idea of breaking down, like we had first, initially we started with a one big monolithic uh, build process, which would do the compilation, which would do all the activities and then produce the build as well. But the problem was broken down into so many tests, so many type of tests. And breaking down the problem helped us use, you know, all the available cores on that machine. And it did speed up our, uh, our, our tests. So, on a single box, this is very easy to do. Uh, the Jenkins box will give you this facility. If you if you are environment, if you have multiple machines, then you can use other features provided by Jenkins. Like you can use a master and slave configurations. What you can do is you can have a master, uh, Jenkins master. You can have multiple slaves on different machines. So let's say in your case, if you do not have uh, bigger machines, but you have smaller machines, then this is a nice way to handle that. Where the multiple machines, uh, you are spreading the jobs across those multiple machines and you are utilizing the power of those individual machines and then aggregating the data. That's, that's a way that Jenkins goes. So that, that also helps in parallel processing? Yes, yes, yes. So, so basically, like, if I do not have, like, my core machine doesn't have a lot of cores, uh, but I have different machines, then instead of using the cores, I'm tackling the problem there. That's also, that, that is also reduced time. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, the time can be also reduced by uh, concurrent geometry runner. This is uh, this is classic in the Matthew. What it does is, uh, if you have a test case, uh, let's say geometry test case, which have 10, 20 scenarios, and assuming that your test scenarios are isolated, which means they can run independent of each other, then the, geomet the concurrent geometry runner uh, would help run all those geometry scenarios in parallel, again utilizing all the cores. Right. So in the earlier options. We were going and distributing the jobs. In this case, within within the unit itself, it's creating multiple jobs. Okay. okay. The last one is failing fast, right? Uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are structuring our build jobs in such a way that it uh, you know gives you the most important feedback first, and uh, things that are bound to fail or things that are going to cause you more pain, you want to know that know that earlier. So. What we did, we restructured our build process in such a way that only the critical things and things that are important at that point of time are, are carried out. And a couple of examples are, we were earlier running inspection builds during every time. So inspection build was where our sonar job was running uh, and looking at uh, the issues that were that are added by the developers. Uh, we also had coverage jobs which would you know, find the coverage per check-in. Now you know, finding of coverage per 
commit for in our case probably we thought that it's not required. Similarly, uh, you know, going and doing inspection of the code that is committed right now, we thought that probably it's not required to do it every time a project is done. But both these activities could be done at the end of the day. But what I did, we identified critical activities. Uh, like so, we still have PMD rules running with every build that we, uh, every commit that we do. But those are the problems that we are aware about and which we, which we know have caused problems in production earlier. So we do want to make sure that the developers don't do the same mistake again. So those we are running at that point of time. But rest, you know, we have organized the entire build uh, so that we get fast feedback. Similarly, we, we broke down the test cases, right? The, the, the test jobs. The again, idea was that split the fast running test and slow running test and, you know, separate them and get, get the feedback again. And the, another thing that we did was, uh, we, we are using we, we are not using any uh, you know, utility like let's say uh, I think he talked about DB fly away or uh, we have um, deploy uh, DB maintain DB deploy these are all puts available to be good database in our case what we are doing is we are having an entity database and we are having a update script and the developers are responsible for actually maintaining both those uh, both those together and what we have found is that when the test ran, at that time we discovered that there is some problem in the schema or later on QA would go and find that okay, the upgraded schema and the MTDB schema are not matching. So such things are critical for us. So we brought those in the test cycle and right in the first job which takes the build, that's why we are doing the comparison and making sure that nothing else runs before these basic things are completed. That's how we have restructured our builds and we have, like, you know, we are getting quick of it. The next thing is uh, incremental builds, right? Uh, earlier, what we were doing uh, in, in the, in the AND uh, task that we had, we had multiple modules and we had a target folder. We were cleaning up the target folder. We were copying all the source codes and adding it to the target folder. And then we were doing compilation. And as you pointed out, when the number of uh, Java files are large, it takes a lot of time to do a, a clean build. So we switched from clean build to incremental build. So instead of, you know, getting into the job of cleaning up all the files, moving all the files. We started pointing the Java C to the respective source code you know, locations. And what that helped us is if there was only one class that got modified, then only that got compiled. And it again started saving saving us time. So that's an option that many people were saying. Excuse me. So I did not get to do actually that. So the Java C command, yeah. there, there itself you can go and tell you know where are the uh, different source locations. Okay. And then it will pick up from the source location, and Java itself will make sure that it will compile only incrementally things that have changed. So it has source and it has destination. Destination has all the classes, and the source it has the source code. It will find you know what has changed, and it will. It will How did you integrate it in the build? Build. How did you integrate it, integrate it with the Jenkins? So our like the Ant script that we are using, okay. it was already there. So all we have to do is modify the Ant script so that it makes sure that it doesn't clean up everything, and it makes sure that it only doesn't increment. Same options are for Maven. Yeah. Maven, I'm not sure because yeah. I've not worked with it. Yeah. Much. It has it? Yeah, uh, when you configure something in, Gen uh, in Jenkins for Maven also, you can specify you want to clean and install or you want to do increment mm -hmm. or, or, or instruction. So that's it's the clean. Clean. It's not going to clean it. Yeah. So it's always going to be clean. Okay. So just a question. So yeah, I mean that's a very good idea to say compile only one Java file. but. How do you find out what Java file is there? There will be some knowledge. We don't have to do that. Java doesn't work. So if you remember, if you are in Eclipse as an example, by default you are doing incremental builds, right? You are not doing clean builds every time. You modify a code, it takes care of that. That's the feature for whatever Java is. We don't have to worry about it. We have to know about it so that we can implement it. Okay, so just to summarize. Uh, what we looked at was focusing on the bottlenecks, uh, try and avoid file operations as much as possible. Uh, if possible, make use of uh, you know smaller data sets, use logo copy, also use uh, like you know async, in memory databases, RAM drives, all are going to help you in you know reducing your disk IO. Then we looked at how uh, doing CPU for for CPU profiling is going to uncover the hidden uh, information inside our inside our code. Similarly, scanning the log files. It's also critical. Scanning the log file, log files will give you little rough more information that you can actually call. The last one is very the build uh, tool settings that we have. So if, if you're using Jenkins, if you're using Maven, and 
if we know more about those tools, then we can highly optimize and use those tools efficiently to our in our plans. Then we talk about divide and conquer. So three ways of dividing and conquer. One, using one Jenkins uh, uh, machine and splitting, creating smaller jobs which can run in parallel. Other option is using multiple machines and creating a master slave environment where you can distribute the jobs. And the third one was using, using uh, concurrent JUnit runner, uh, which will run multiple test scenarios within the same test class in parallel. But there you have to make sure that your tests are truly isolated from each other and they can actually run independent of each other. The last thing that we saw was failing fast. If there is an opportunity of failure, then we want to fail as quick as possible uh, so that we get ample amount of time to recover from it and to re attempt and to get the feedback. So after spending so much of time and working through our journey, well, this is where we have landed. Uh, this graph shows you like how earlier our build time. This, this is our build time, and this is the number of builds that we were, uh, you know, per, per, carrying over here. Then uh, we started working. Uh, not everything was done in one shot, right? So gradually we got our build time down, and we started getting our number of builds started increasing. So the first dip that you see here was done because of like the workspace, the duplication in the workspace that we have removed it, uh, then and we discovered an AND option, we removed the fourth from parameter and we started using AND. So that you know that was the first big dip. The next dip uh, was achieved by using caching, uh, spring, caching the spring context, caching the uh, resources and avoiding emails. The third dip was by using Luda, big time and deprecated Java daily players. The last thing that you see there is because of the <coughs> uh, So, you know, now, like, you know, pretty much this evidently gives a lot of business value. And not just it gives business value, but it also has, uh, you know, good impact on life. Obviously, the colleagues are happy, uh, they can go home, doctors are happy. And throughout this journey, I had to actually use, uh, refer to a lot of resources. And I've visited all the resources here that have helped me in, in too much here. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, would would mocking frameworks uh, also help, help with respect to speeding up? Because what typically happens is you have a database access layer that does tests on the database directly. So you have the business layer that uses the DAO, right? But having that layer again do uh, database operations can be sort of avoided if you use that. Like, yes. In between. Yes. Uh, we have. We don't. Uh, uh, we never started with Agile or not having these practices of test cases right from the beginning. We have evolved over a period of time. Now, when you evolve things, the simplest thing to do is you know start with the topmost layer and you know go up to the you know, bottommost layer. So we actually landed up you know having all the data that is required uh, for the test. Uh, but yeah, mocking could definitely be helpful wherever possible. Again, in the context of the test, like you know, I talked talked about one integration test. In the integration test, we were actually going and connecting to the other system and coming back. So it was required in that context. But in other cases where I was not required to connect, all I need to know is whether uh, if it is successful, what happens? If it fails, what happens? In that context, I don't need to have that system available. And I can simply mock it and give you the That's definitely the same thing. You mentioned that you removed the workspace and the point yes. to the parent one. But then the master is working on one job is working on a parent uh, workspace. Simultaneously, other jobs are also trying to access that one. So Jenkins doesn't do that. Way. Basically, what it does is, uh, when you are setting up those jobs, uh, jobs that way, what you are doing, you are starting your parent job, and then it is spawning the next jobs. Mm -hmm. So while this job is running, mm -hmm. the same job will not run again. And once this job is over, only then the children jobs are. Yeah, the they are not running parallelly. Yeah, way. that was yeah, that definitely causes a problem. So let's say for example. Uh, we, we are using a couple of properties file to point to, to, to refer to which database that we want to use. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, earlier, because we were you know, copying the entire workspace at that point of time, everyone had its own copy, so it could simply refer to it. Uh, but as soon as we started sharing the workspace, that caused a problem. So what we had to do was, for every test, uh, test job that we had, we had to create separate folders in our let's say, release folder. Uh, so test integration, test uh, uh, BDD, test liberation and in those respective test folders we got our resources which are required for that test and that's all is the test is okay but the entire build we cannot use that strategy because 
uh, we have to have a local coffee, frustrating jars, and uh, have you created entire artifacts that have cross impact to the it, it actually depends on the context, right? It, depending upon your context, you have to figure out, okay, how I can do it. Uh, so let's say, for example, if you're publishing your artifacts to artifactly, the next set of jobs probably don't need your workspace as such. Probably they just need to get the artifacts from artifactly or next, right? So you have to figure out what works in your context. In our context, we were running tests because predominantly the most important thing that, that we are doing in our Jenkins environment is running tests. So for tests, it works with us. Well, anything else? Any other question? Anymore? Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks for your time.